Today we're going to learn about one of the earliest, most important skyscrapers built in the United States of America, which is sadly now a Target. Spoiler alert. So this video is all about Chicago burning and the skyscraper being born. We're going to focus on the Carson Peary Scott & Company building designed by Louis Sullivan, and you can find this building in Chicago, Illinois. Something that's really important to take away from this video, first and foremost, is that the skyscraper, even though now it's found around the world, it truly was an American invention. And here are some great examples of American skyscrapers, older and newer. We have the Empire State Building, which was built during the Great Depression, the Seagram Building, which was built during the 50s, Beekman Tower, which was in the 90s, and close to home down in Miami, we have 1000 Museum, which is a new skyscraper of condos built by the architect Zaha Hadid, who is actually on our curriculum, but it's another building, um, the Maxi Museum in Rome. So guys, the skyscraper game is going strong. But we're not going to talk about how it's going now. We have to talk about how it started. And these early skyscrapers can look really puny and small and just sad, quite frankly, compared to contemporary skyscrapers. But we have to start somewhere. So the skyscraper was born in the city of Chicago. In general, early 20th century American architecture is attached to the city of Chicago. And the reason for that is the why is that Chicago burned down. In 1871, the Great Chicago Fire pretty much destroyed the entire city. Very few things survived. And uh, the positive, I guess, if we can find a positive in that pretty horrific story, is that it was a blank slate. So a whole bunch of architects came to this Chicago area, which is usually called Chicago land now by the people who live there, and uh, built it up. And they decided to do new innovative things there. And this group of architects is called the Chicago School. And uh, Louis Sullivan, the architect on our curriculum we're talking about now, is definitely one of the most important members of the Chicago School. Something that they realize is that land value in cities is, is you know, there's not a lot of it and it's very expensive. FYI, in New York City, there is no land left. So people have started to sell air. If someone owns a plot of land, they will sell the air above a building that already exists if buildings can be built taller and people will buy the airspace. That's how limited land is. So it was at this point in history that they realized that in order to fit more people into a small space, they had to start building up instead of out. And that is where we start to get the beginning of the skyscraper. So this is called the Carson Peary Scott & Company building. And again, it's in Chicago, Illinois. Louis Sullivan is the architect right at the turn of the century from uh, 1899 to 1903. And it is made of iron, steel, glass, and terracotta. We have three official curriculum pictures. We have the exterior, we have the corner entrance, and we have the floor plan. So here's our boy Louis Sullivan, handsome man that he was. His name was actually Henry Louis Sullivan, but he went by Louis Sullivan most of the time, or Louis Sullivan. So he had one foot in the 19th century and one foot in the 20th. Most of his buildings can be found in Chicago. You can find some of his other structures in other Midwest cities. He was modern, but he always maintained some level of decoration in his buildings, which makes him early modern. Uh, he kept craft in his buildings. He was very uh, infatuated with a style from the late 1900s, excuse me, late 1800s called Art Nouveau, which is very nature-based and plant-looking. And he adds these decorative touches to his structures. And I'm going to show you examples of that on our building. He was the teacher of probably one of the most famous 20th century American architects, Frank Lloyd Wright. And uh, he was the biggest member of the Chicago School. So there were two big inventions that had to come along in order for the skyscraper to be possible. Number one was the development of steel, and number two was the elevator. So steel was developed during the Industrial Revolution and really kind of perfected throughout the 1800s. So by the time we get to the early 1900s, steel was incredibly strong, durable, one of the most durable materials you can use to make structures. And the thing is about steel, you do not need as much of it to make a building that is stronger than a building that might be made out of olive stone, for instance. Uh, steel also does well in cold weather, which is a big deal. And then the elevator, which was invented in 1880. If you're going to build a structure over about five stories tall, these are going to become pretty essential. Buildings are also going to have staircases all the time just for emergencies, but the elevator was essential. 
So must know this about Louis Sullivan. He had this philosophy about architecture and he coined it form follows function. This was his saying, and this is what he taught all of his students. What a building will be used for its function should determine how it's designed its form. So form your design for a building must follow your understanding of its function. If a building is going to be an office building, it has to have a certain design, a certain layout. If a building is going to be an opera house, it's going to have a very different design, very different layout. So you can't determine the form of your structure, what it will look like, until you know its function. So that is what form follows function means. If we take a look at the floor plan for the Carson Peary Scott and Company building, this is just one of the floors. Notice, guys, there's not a lot of thick blackness anywhere. You don't need as much steel to support a structure. There are a whole bunch of what look like columns, and they are, but those are steel posts. And there are no walls on any of these floors because an open floor plan was essential. The Carson Peary Scott and Company building was going to be a department store, and therefore your displays change on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. So you need to have flexibility. You can't have permanent walls blocking people's view from one part of the floor to another. So open floor plan was essential. We can also see up here at the top of the image and over here on the side, these boxes marked with X's, those are the elevator shafts. And then we can see that there are two staircases as well. So open floor plans were pretty essential. So some things to recap, this building is possible because of a steel support. It has an interior structure or an interior skeleton, think of it that way, of steel. The exterior is made out of stone and terracotta, and it makes it look like a traditional building. It uh, really doesn't need to be there, though. It's more for decoration. And its function was to be a department store. So if Louis Sullivan's philosophy was form must follow function, this building is going to be a department store. So what does Louis Sullivan decide to do with the form of the structure? How does he design it to make it fit that function? Well, number one, the windows at the very bottom are, have to be big. This is where you're going to showcase your product displays. This is where people on the street are going to walk by and you want them to see the stuff that you have to sell them. And hopefully they're going to come into your store and buy your stuff. Louis Sullivan always puts decoration on his buildings, but on a department store, the decoration has to go at the bottom. Again, to emphasize those big windows and to draw viewers and to draw shoppers towards the store so they'll come in and buy the stuff. This is decorated with cast iron. It's very, very, very pretty. I'm going to show you close-ups in a minute. Something he did that was quite genius with this space was he put the entrance at the corner. This building sits at a corner lot, so if he would have put the entrance on one of the sides, you can't see it from all directions, but if you put the entrance on the corner, no matter what direction you approach this building from, you can see where the entrance is. So you're going to, again, attract more shoppers. And then in on all of those floors where you're going to sell your products, you need to have a lot of light to um, illuminate all those products, all those clothes, all those things that you want to sell people. So this building has big Chicago style windows. They look like triptychs. And uh, I'm going to show you a close up of those in a moment. Here we go. So triptychs are um, like a large central panel and two side small panels. That's pretty much what the Chicago window looks like. You can find them all over. Go figure the city of Chicago. They're quite famous. And um, inside of the lip of each one of those windows, there are these beautiful Art Nouveau kind of plant like looking inspired displays. Um, inspired design, excuse me. And uh, that's something that you're not going to find on a building like designed about 20 or 30 years later. This is something that's unique to Louis Sullivan, who is an early 20th century architect. Here's the lip of the top of the structure. Look at all that beautiful carved Art Nouveau inspired, de inspired decoration. It pretty much looks like beautiful plant, um, like symmetrical designs almost like arabesques when we looked at Islamic architecture. Here's the corner entrance. There's that cast iron decoration, which is also heavily inspired by Art Nouveau. It is beautiful. It's going to attract people to come up to those windows and those doors and look at it and then hopefully go inside. 
Uh, he managed to sneak his initials into this design as well. Henry Louis Sullivan, HLS. And here is a view from the inside of the, um, of that en entrance, that corner entrance. So next time you find yourself in Chicago, go check out the Carson Peary Scott and Company building.